this talk is, is called How to Infect Your Organization with Humane Ops. And humane ops is a concept we talk about a lot. Or, uh, in fact, this whole track is the human ops track. So we're gonna talk about those uh, squirrely little things called people. Uh, my name is Maddie Stratton. I'm a DevOps evangelist at PagerDuty. Uh, this is usually the slide when I would put up my whole resume slide that talks about what I do, where I've been. I've kind of realized that nobody really cares. This is the part when normally in your presentation you're like, this is why you should listen to me because I've done all these things. So instead I just have pictures of my kids to get you on my side. So you're like, well, at least he has cute kids, right? So I asked, went to, uh, usually when I'm trying to source ideas or content for talks, I like to just go to Twitter and have other people do my work for me. So I went and I asked the question, I said, describe your on-call situation in three words. And this was some of the responses that we got. I kind of liked, uh, please mute yourself, scotch, 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 and as Emily said, a dumpster fire. So on call is not delightful. Uh, yesterday, Rachel talked a little bit about how we do on call at um, pager duty, and when you follow processes like good incident command, it can make on call more pleasant, or at least less unpleasant. But the reality is that nobody likes on call, and in most environments and most teams and most organizations, it's something we really don't like. And what I wanna talk about a little bit today is what are the things that we can do to make this a better experience for our colleagues? And I'm gonna approach this from a couple different ways, because a lot of times when we go out there and we say, <clears throat> should on call be better for our coworkers? Everyone says, of course it should, that would be fantastic. Great, well, what are you gonna do about it? Well, I can't do anything, I'm not a manager. I'm not a director, I'm not in the ELT. I don't have the ability to pay people to be on call to make their life better. I can't do all these things that we mystically think only big important management type people can do. The reality is that there's thing, everybody can do something to make on call better, even if you're not part of the on call rotation. Because, you know, maybe, maybe you disagree with me that devs should be on call, maybe your organization doesn't have that be a case. So you may be a software engineer that's not on call, that doesn't mean that you don't have colleagues who have to deal with this, that you can do things to make it better. So I'm gonna approach this from the perspective of someone who might be in management and the things you might be able to do and also as individual contributors. So fundamentally, no matter what your role in the organization, there's something you can do to make it better. But before, let's talk a little bit about why. Why does this matter? <clears throat> so we commissioned a study over 10,000 companies and over 100 different industry segments and this was across 50,000 responders, and during this time, these were people who received over 760 million notifications. So it's a point being, pretty big sample set. We wanted to understand what made people leave their job. People who were responders to incidents, why did they leave? So a couple things we looked at of these people, these were all folks who had left their, uh, you know, left their position in the last 18 months. So these, as a, as a large group, 60 million notifications occurred during dinner hours. 82 million notifications occurred during evening hours. And 250 million occurred during sleeping time. And 122 million over the weekend. These are all, uh, if we look at something that's common about this, these are all times when, hey, we're not supposed to be working. We're supposed to be having this mythical work-life balance during this time. Clearly a lot of stuff happens. And this is a total of 750, almost three quarters of a million nights that had sleep interrupting notifications of some kind. So, what did we find? We discovered when we looked at those people who are, were responders to incidents and had left their position in the last 18 months, we found three most meaningful metrics on that attrition. One was the number of days where responders work and life were interrupted. So when you looked at that number, now it doesn't mean that this happening at all means somebody left, but there was a number, a number that indicated this. If this number was too high within a certain amount of time, people left. Number of days when a responder was woken overnight and the number of weekend days. These are the three biggest things. When we did a survey across all these people, it wasn't how much money do you make, it wasn't are your coworkers jerks, it was how many times do I get woken up in the middle of the night? How often is my workday interrupted by on call? How often is my life interrupted? So those are the three most important things. And why do we care about attrition? 
Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, unfortunately use some US dollar number here because that's what I know. But in the US, the average replacement cost of a software engineer or a technology engineer is $350,000. That's a lot of money, right? Compared to being able to keep somebody. So it's pretty important, to, besides the fact that we want to make on-call better, we wanna make this experience better for our colleagues because they're fellow humans and we should treat fellow humans nicely, we also don't want to waste a lot of money. So how do we do, go about doing this? Um, so this is uh, Richard Dawkins, and Richard Dawkins, uh, he coined the term meme, and we usually think about memes as the things that have been a big up on the screen, but a meme is also, in general, as Dawkins said, it's tunes, ideas, catchphrases, they're things that way, that propagate themselves into our gene pool by leaping from body to body, right? So memes propagate themselves from going to brain to brain through imitation. We're gonna talk a little bit about this is how we can help. If we aren't someone that sits there and says, I can pay people a shift differential for being on call, we can help set examples. We can create memes through our organization that will make this experience better. Um, another thing, if you're not familiar with Richard Dawkins, he's a very famous atheist. I first gave this talk in Salt Lake City in the United States, which is where the Mormons are from. Um, it was a little awkward, but it's okay. So if we think about this, memes are a way of evolving across generations, right? As we go from generation to generation. So there's a, a fairly well-known, some might say it's a cyberpunk book. We might, we could actually have a whole talk about discussing whether or not Snow Crash fits into the genre of cyberpunk, but let's say it does. Uh, called Snow Crash. And one of the ideas in Snow Crash is that neurolingual viruses as memes evolve through from generation through generation. So in the book, Snow Crash itself is a neurolinguistic virus. And the bad guys in the book, they figure out a way to unlock this virus and it spreads from hacker to hacker like a meme, right? And there's also lots of swordplay, so it's kind of a cool book. So uh, now the thing is, Neil Stevenson, the author of the book, in this he says, ideology is a virus. Ideology is a virus. We're going to take these ideals of humane on-call and we're gonna spread them through our organization like a virus. So, talked about this a little bit. We said, everyone has different roles in an organization and your ability to affect change will be different depending upon your role. So we're gonna start as the supreme leader. You're some big, big shot manager, senior manager, VP, something like that. What are the things that a supreme leader can do? So number one, learn first and foremost that the ideas of command and control don't work. Emily talked about this a little bit in her talk, right, about squads being empowered. And, and the, the irony is that we, we like to think that command and control is effective, whereas Almost every military in the world has abandoned this in favor of maneuver warfare, which is what Emily talked about, which is the command is take that hill. It's not take that hill this way. The sooner that senior management understands that command and control does not function, that's, that's one of the best things you can do if you're in this position. Using measurement for good, not for evil. This is a tricky one. Numbers are inherently neutral, right? They're not good or bad. The same numbers that we might use for, for measuring uh, productivity, productivity measurement, that can be a great thing. Hey, are we doing the right stuff? Let's reward the right thing. Guess what happens with the same number that helps you understand if you should reward? Can also be used to punish. Uh, we have um, a product at PagerDuty, it's the Operational uh, uh, Management Health Service, where because we can measure using a lot of tooling, um, the operational health of your organization. We can look at it and say, hey, we know that people are gonna burn out if the way that they respond to alerts, for example, starts to slow down. Because you know what happens when people start to get burned out? They respond to pages not as, in not as a timely manner. There's a very specific reason that in that product, we don't just give you those numbers. You have to work with us. You know why? Because we don't trust you to be good. Because you know what, that same number that says, hey, you know what, Evo, you're not responding to pages quickly, you're probably burning out. Could also be turned around and be like, Evo, you're not responding to pages quickly, you're on a performance plan. So use numbers for good, not for evil. And avoid what's called the executive swoop. And uh, I, think, I think Rachel touched on this a little bit. We talked about incident command. One of the tip, toughest things about being an incident commander is when that CEO or that management person gets on the call and does this, right? So trust your people. 
You hired smart people to do the smart thing. Stay out of their way. Avoid the executive swoop. I'm going to give you a little bonus tip. Um, if you ever find yourself as an incident commander, I'll give you one little, little trip that we give in our training about how to handle executive swoop. When your executive comes in and starts demanding this, you turn to them and say, Mr. Vader, are you taking over command of this incident? And watch how quickly they get quiet. So probably most of us in this room are not Supreme Leader Snoke, are not, you know, CIOs or senior VPs. Maybe you are. That's great if you are. I hope you're listening. We might have uh, more middle management. Middle management is not necessarily used in a kind of derogatory Dilbert term here, but folks who are managing teams. There's a lot of things that we can do as well as managers. So one of those things is encourage a safe post-incident review space. Encourage the ability to have blameless post-mortems. Some of this is stuff, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna bear in mind, I wanna give you a little bit of a spoil for later. This is all may sound like common sense to you. You may be saying, Maddie, you're up here just telling us all the normal DevOps stuff, and my question to you is, and why aren't you doing it? Okay? Um, drive for a culture of learning. Again, there's, there's a great quote from some John Cowie, who's at Chef now, but he was at Etsy for a long time. He said, it's amazing what you, what you can accomplish when the only ramification of making a mistake is you learn something new. So having a culture of learning, it's okay to make mistakes because we learn from them. And again, just like your Supreme Leader, you hired smart people, get out of their way. Use your smart people. So let's talk a little bit about that culture of learning. What does that actually mean? So if we don't treat every outage or alert as something to learn from or to improve, we run the risk of something called normalization of deviance, right? And in this case, we start to accept alerts or degradations as acceptable, right? Uh, our standards suffer, suffer. We let things slip through the cracks. This is kind of happening in the country where I live right now. We are actually, as a country, suffering from normalization of deviance, which is we are getting used to a lot of terrible things and that lets more terrible things happen. This can happen within your organization as well because we say, oh, it's okay for things to break. That's just how things are. That's how things, oh, that, that, that service always fails. Oh, well. So in a generative performance-oriented organization, we say that failure leads to inquiry. I didn't make this up. A gentleman named Ron Westrom did, and I have links to this. All, all the links that I provide in here, I'm gonna tell you about at the end so you can follow up on them, but this, this bit.ly link would take you to uh, some articles by Ron. You could also ask the, not, Dr. Nicole Forsgren of um, Dora, who, who does the DevOps, uh, State of the DevOps report. She's a, a big fan of Ron Westrom and why, actually, to be quite honest, everybody in the DevOps community knows who Westrom is, is because of Nicole. So go ahead and follow her on Twitter and you'll learn a lot about how to uh, rub numbers on your DevOps. So here's the other thing too. I can say use a force even if you aren't a Jedi. So this is, the, this is the scenario of the, hey, maybe I'm not the supreme leader, I'm not a middle manager, but what are the things I can do to affect change? What are the things we can do to set examples and maybe do things that are outside of my remit, outside of my job description, right? So one of the things to think about is to review all the things. So Andy Fleener, who uh, is the platform operations manager at a company called Sports Engine, he said they, they review every alert from the last 24 hours or over the weekend every day. He says no broken windows. What he's talking about there is what's again called the broken window effect, which is normalization of deviance, which is the idea of that is in the neighborhood. If you leave a window broken, people say, oh, it's okay for there to be broken windows. This must be, you know, that means that maybe crime becomes okay and a whole bunch of other things start to happen. So at, at Sports Engine, they have a meeting every morning and they go back and they look at all the alerts that happened over the last 24 hours so that everybody is aware of them. It's not pointing fingers. It's not even necessarily trying to solve for them. It's just an awareness thing. It's situational awareness. So thinking more about normalization of deviance, right? A couple things to think about this. So the definition is saying it's this gradual process where unacceptable practice or standards become acceptable. This deviant behavior is repeated. If there is not catastrophic result, that becomes a social norm for the organization. This is what we become used to. We become used to the bad things and they become the norm. This happened in NASA twice. This is what happened with the Challenger explosion and also happened with Columbia because it was, oh, this is okay, right? These small things. In our case, 
we're not having shuttles explode, hopefully, we're not. But what we have is that we accept alerts or degradations as acceptable. You know, there was the, the fun Ignite yesterday was showing about how developers and people are good at writing those Outlook rules that just say, I just put them into my deleted items. How many people have worked in an environment or work in an environment now where you get these false positive alerts that are, and you just go, oh, I know I can ignore that because that's not real, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, when I was at apartments.com, we had, I could always tell when it was one in the morning if I was awake because I would get the little page that said our backend database server was unreachable. The reason was because the, the database backup was running and that pegged the CPU for about a minute and a half. Here's the problem. What happens if something actually happened to that database server during that time? Nobody would pay attention because we're like, oh, it's 1 a.m., ADB0 is getting backed up, no big deal, that must be what it is. Normalization of deviance. Uh, question metrics. We wanna make sure that we're setting the proper expectations. We don't wanna just expect five nines of reliability because, well, five is better than four. Why do you need five? Are these metrics tied to a business outcome? And this is where you have to have, as Emily would say, be bold, right? You might have to question, you might have to challenge your product owners, challenge your management, because oftentimes we will get metrics and we don't know why. You know, um, I used to have to run the uh, page speed metrics for an e-commerce site and present them to my CTO, presented them to the board, and I said, when, once after, after I was doing this for a few months, I said, Pat, what's our, what's our goal? And she said, not slower than last month. <laughs> so there's no actual, and there was no number around that. There was no, hey, if the page is faster, then that leads to more conversion, or even more important, this particular number means something. So, and also, watch out for inaccurate extra, uh, extrapolation. So you might have data that suggests that if the page load time increases by a second, conversion drops by 50%. But that doesn't mean that if you reduce load time by a second, it increases an additional 50%. Correlation doesn't necessarily equal causation. And numbers don't move the dials in the same direction, right? So a decrease in performance can have a decrease in conversion, but an increase in performance does not necessarily mean you'll have an increase in conversion. Our supreme leaders like to think that that's true. So try to find a way to actually tie your performance metrics to business outcomes. So again, why are we using these numbers, right? So what is the data that drives your incident process? When an incident gets raised, how do you know to raise one? I'll give you a clue. Memory utilization on a server is not an incident. It might be an indicator, but what matters is can people buy shoes on your website, provided that you sell shoes on your website. If you don't, don't monitor for selling shoes on your website because it'll probably always fail. Are the metrics tied to business outcomes? Again, a lot of times, uh, <laughs> people may have been in talks like this, and this, is, this was uh, really common at DevOps days a couple years ago to do the fun. How many people in here you know, believe they're part, you know, they're, you're part of Dev? Oh, that's me. How many are part of Ops? That's me. How many are the business? Everybody should have raised your hand. Like, there were like 12 talks at least you know, a year that used that same thing. But it's true. You know, business outcomes are what matter. Our goal is not to keep the website up. Our goal is not to ship features. Our goal is to do the thing that makes our business or our organizational organization successful. And if you don't know what that is, you better darn well find out because there's no way, if you don't, and, and this is the thing where Bridget, Bridget and I will disagree often because I like to always tie things back to making money and she points out that not every organization is about making money, but, I will ask you to extrapolate this for your own purposes. If you do not know how your organization makes money, go find out, we'll wait. Because if you don't know, you don't know how to make the right decisions for your organization. In the case of a nonprofit, if you don't know how your organization shows value, if you don't know how your organization does the thing that makes it exist, you need to know. And correlation doesn't always equal causation. So those are key points. Another thing you can do to make uh, on-call suck less, I think that's trademark, our competitor maybe, but that's okay, uh, to make on-call more humane. Think about simplicity. Do not over-design your systems. You heard yesterday about this idea called resume-driven development. 
Resume-driven development is almost always a recipe for on-call disasters. And this is what I call Stratton's Law, because I named one after myself. This is actually Stratton's Law of Catastrophic Predestination, which is at the heart of every complex resilient system there is, it is, is the hubris that someone believed they could predict everything that could go wrong. Fate and the internet laugh at you, right? So the more resiliently you design your system, the more likely it is to cause a negative business impact. You don't always need seven layers of fault tolerance. Again, go back to those metrics. Why does this, how reliable does the system have to be? Because by design, by definition, the more fault tolerant you make your system, the more parts it has, the more places there actually are for confusion. Here's a couple things you can do. Talk to people. These are your fellow humans, right? Ask your on-call how they're feeling during stand-ups. Maybe you're not an on-call person, but someone who's on-call communicates with you. During stand-ups, say, hi, how's it going? How has on-call been going? What was last night like? Give them the opportunity to mention that they might be burning out. Think about who are your customers and what are their expectations. Your customers may be internal or external or both. Most of us, our, our real customers are probably internal at the end of the day, right? We're, we're doing some type of service for people inside our organization. Whose customer are you and can you help them out? Who provides service to you, your network team, your storage team, your help desk? What are things you can do to help them out? And what are the perceptions of your team? This can be hard to dig into and it requires listening, but everybody who's done on-call rotation has a little mental thought about every other team that they support and how helpful and supportive or not they might be. So try to understand the perception of your team with the people who, whose customer you are. And if it's not excessively positive, you've got some work to do. So again, we're still talking about people. These are all people. So consider contextual on call. What does that mean? Let's say that you have a general ledger system that only works from nine to five during the day, right? That's the only time. Does that mean that someone should be woken up at two in the morning if there's something wrong with it? You can have different levels, different necessities of on call depending upon the context. You can also have different people have being on call, depending upon the time of day or depending upon the context. Again, the golden rule, which uh, can be, there's two types of the golden rule. I mean, we know the one which is do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. There's also Wheaton's Law, Will Wheaton of internet and Star Trek fame, which is don't be a dick. So keep that in mind when you're interacting with people. Treat them the way that you would expect to be treated. Because you know what? In your organization, you are somebody's customer and somebody is your customer. So think about how annoying the business is to you and try to not be that way to the people that support you. And, you know, you can bake cookies. So this idea of cookie ops, right? Uh, this actually, on topic, just happened two days ago. So how many people remember what happened to Slack two days ago? Maybe we didn't notice because we were all at DevOps days, but Slack had a pretty big outage and everybody freaks out. And you know what our director of SRE, or I don't remember what a Rube's title is right now, but he, he, we literally sent them cupcakes and they loved it. They tweeted about it. That made their day. Maybe it didn't make their day. It was a pretty bad day. Made their day a little less awful. So does that mean that you need to like send cupcakes to GitHub when they take an outage? Not necessarily, you could, but think about the people within your organization. I, <laughs> I had uh, at one, one company I was at, the, uh, a peer of mine who I was, I was managing tech ops and he was managing DBAs. And he said, he's like, he's like, man, how come you always have the new laptop and the new phone? And I was like, you know what? I said, watch me at Christmas time sometime. Who goes down to the TOCC with fresh cookies? Who in the summer brings homemade strawberry jam? Who goes and talks to them like they're people? Me. Who complains a lot and is really noisy and yells a lot when stuff is broken? You. So guess why? I've got the new iPhone and you don't. So these things happen, they're true. We like, we remember people who treat us nicely, who treat us like fellow humans. And volunteer to be an incident commander, like we learned about yesterday, right? 
if you, if you are not part of a formal on-call, try to figure out a way to volunteer to help out as an incident commander. If you say, what's an incident commander? Maybe you should have them. Maybe that's a thing your organization should have because that's a way to help share the load. One of the things that was really important that Rachel touched on yesterday um, that she mentioned was our incident command rotation is two days. That's not very stressful. It's not taking a lot, right? So that's a way to help. And it's a way to help even if you aren't necessarily the, the person who can do all the things. So during a couple things that can be helpful from a perspective of incident command, or maybe you don't call it incident command, but just when you're running in is when you're having an on-call problem happen. So make it nice on the bridge that you're on, right? So you wanna do things like have clearly defined roles, know who's doing what, right? Whether, that, whether you follow processes like we do with incident command and you have a scribe and you have SMEs or whatever, you may call them tech leader and smart person or whatever you call them, but know what those roles are, have them clearly defined. Avoid the bystander effect that Rachel talked about. You know, you're gonna be very clear about assignments. These are all things that make being on call. At two in the morning, you appreciate this because stuff gets done better and faster. Rally fast and disband faster. I believe very strongly in this. You wanna get the right people involved as soon as possible, as soon as, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. You wanna get the right people involved as soon as you need to but you want to get them off the call as soon as possible. You can get them back if you need them. How many people have ever been on uh, one of those fun hundred people uh, problem bridge? How many people can imagine that they exist? How many people would never want to do that and are super glad they haven't? So here's the fun thing about that hundred people bridge. 95 of them are doing nothing and they're pissed off. And they're sitting there going, oh my God, why am I on the phone? Why am I on the phone? Why am I on the phone? And that does two bad things. That's bad morale and a bad experience for the 95 because it's, what, I don't care what time it is, it's, it's unpleasant. It's also bad morale and bad experience for the five because they're sitting there knowing they've got 95 irritated people watching their every move. So rally fast and disband faster. This is tough, a lot of organizations don't like this. They wanna, let's get every single person who might ever have heard of this service ever on the call and we'll sit there until it's done. No good. And don't litigate severity. That means in the middle of a problem, whatever we decided the problem was worth, that's what it is. We're not gonna argue about it. We've already figured out what a severity one is or severity two is. We don't argue about it when it's happening. We wanna focus on solving the problem, right? That's the thing, any, any conversations about should we be doing this, should we not be doing this? By the way, these are things that your executive swoops like to do a lot, so you wanna kind of be able to turn that one off. And have a clear mechanism for making decisions. We like to call this the is there any strong objection rule, right? Rachel talked about a lot of this yesterday too. So a uh, couple, couple other things, sharing is caring. Share all the tests, what does that mean? So tests are for software engineers and SREs both. That means, or you might say they are for dev and for ops both. I was trying to be hip by saying SWE, which by the way, like two months ago I learned was a term. I guess that's the, the, the hip acronym for you know, software engineers. Um, so, but here's my thought, and this is true. That was really arrogant. My thought is true. Um, all functional tests that are used in pre-production should have a corresponding monitor in production. What does this mean? It means monitoring is nothing but testing with a time dimension. Similarly, if you're monitoring functionality in production, you need to have corresponding tests in the build and release process. This is, this is more uh, uncommon than you might think. And the reason is because you have different groups who are in charge of those different things. Your QA testers are the people who are doing the pre-prod tests. Your SREs maybe are the people who are monitoring in production. But here's my thought. If it's that important that you are actually testing it to say if this gets released to production, then X should equal X, well, or whatever, then this should be true, then why aren't you testing it in production to make sure it's still true? And likewise, if this is a thing that's gonna control whether my pager goes off, you should be testing it before it gets released. This is the kind of thing that sounds like common sense. It's not so common. This is why a few years ago, Damon Edwards said maybe we should rename DevOps Common Sense, and you notice we have not, because it's not so common. <laughs> so here's the thing that you can do. Every sprint, make a, make a little resolution to yourself, and every sprint, do one nice thing. So help your responders in each and every sprint, even if it's not on a card, right? So in every sprint, 
or work unit, whatever you call them, add some value in some way to people who respond to incidents, even if there's no user story for it, even if it's not on a Kanban card. You rebel, right? It's okay. All the scrum masters will, will they just won't know what happened, it's okay. So what are some examples of things that you can do, right? And again, these may seem obvious to you. And I say if they're so obvious, I assume that you've already done them all, so great. Um, providing better context and logging. Stack traces are not context and logging, I'm sorry, right? Stack traces are part of it, but give some context. Remove some technical debt. Yes, you have technical debt, you will find some. Go remove some in every sprint, right? And then also add some useful tests. And the reason that I put in that parenthetical of useful is to uh, steal an, an anecdote from, uh, from Jez Humble. He was working with an organization who had set a goal that said in every sprint they were gonna add a test. And what that meant is in every sprint they added a test that said assert equals true. <laughs> they added tests, they didn't test anything, but they sure did add some tests. So again, we all find ways to game the system. So add, make sure your tests you add are useful. And then also remove something unused. More complexity, harder it is to troubleshoot. There's something in your code base. This goes back to your technical debt. You've got something in there that isn't being used. Pull it out, get rid of it. Your responders will thank you. Other ways to add value. If you use feature flags, add a description field inside the configuration so people know what the feature flag actually does. If you use runbooks, ensure that they are up to date every time you cut a release. If you don't do this, consider abandoning the runbook altogether, okay? An incorrect runbook is worse than no runbook. This is a little bit of a controversial statement as I learned on Twitter, but I still think it's true. If you cannot keep your runbooks up to date, then don't have them. And simplify, simplify. So, though it should have given some ideas, uh, some places to start, it's by no means exhaustive. The main idea I want you to walk away from this is that making on-call for your colleagues and for yourself more humane is not something that requires a management edict. It's not something that requires a digital transformation project that's two years long. It requires changes, there are, it, it can be done with small changes in our day-to-day -day work. And what happens is like a virus and like a meme, these things grow by adoption. You're setting an example to your fellow engineers, to the people that you work with, they will take these on as their own as well and it will grow through the organization. So I'd love to hear in open spaces, out on the, the plaza and the terrace, whatever we call it, let's hear some fun on-call stories. I hear we actually have a fun open space that was pitched all about this. Those are some of my favorites. It's also my favorite interview question to ask. Um, this is the slide to take a picture of. So this is where the, 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 the deck will be linked on my notice. Um, and the only reason I say that is not because I think my slides are so amazing that you're gonna wanna look at them over and over again, but because of the next slide. Wow, this is like a lot of pressure. The next slide is just a bunch of links. But because I do have uh, a couple slides, these are, if you go to notice, you'll find them here as well as the links. But these are a couple of the uh, resources you might find helpful. So that improving your employee retention with real-time ops data, that's a webinar that's all of the data that we did in PagerDuty, and then remember back at the beginning of the talk, and I said we did this survey with all these first responders, not first responders, but IT responders. Um, Page It Forward is a blog post that I wrote on this topic and uh, talking about normalization of deviance. The study of information flow is Ron Westrom. Um, if you haven't read Snow Crash, I was gonna say if you haven't read it, you should read it, but I just read somebody on Twitter yesterday was complaining about people saying that I can't believe you haven't read Snow Crash. So if you choose to read it. Um, we did an episode of Arrested DevOps uh, called Disasters. I don't think I was on that one, I think that was just Bridget. But anyway, you should check it out. And as uh, Rachel pointed out yesterday, we at PagerDuty open source our incident response docs. I recommend checking that out. Uh, the other thing that, um, that I think is very cool about that is we, they are literally open source, not source open. So if you go to response.pagerduty.com, it's the very pretty web interface of looking at our docs. But there's also a link to the GitHub repo, and we do accept pull requests. 
we have, well, let me put it this way, we have accepted pull requests, doesn't mean we're gonna accept all of them because, I mean, but it's a good place you could fork that, you could use it as a starting point um, for what you do, so thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Manny? None? I'll be, I'll be around the rest of the day, so I'd like to hear your stories and think about things you've done. Oh. Oh, okay. There it is. Oh. So, I have a question. Um, assuming that you're, you're the, the, the team you're working in is reluctant to set uh, any formal, uh, let's say, we provide service between these and these hours, and yet they call you anytime they feel like that it should be working and it's not working. Mm. Uh, what would you suggest you would go about that? So you have, if I just want to make sure I, I got the question right, so you, you have a team that works during business hours, but you have customers that assume you work at all hours. Yes, and there's no SLA in And you place. don't have an SLA, so this is some informal understanding in your... <sighs> part, part of that goes... Uh, I, again, the, the hard part of this is, is I'm going to always go back to that you have to talk to humans. Um, so you say you don't have a formal SLA, and I don't expect that that means you have to write up a big document, but it does seem that there's a, there's a, a misunderstanding of expectation, right? And, and my, the, the thing that I would look into is where did that come from? Like, you have one expectation on your team, which is we work this way. Somehow the expectation is that they expect something different. Um, try to understand why. And I'm not saying like, oh, be super empathetic and, and work 24 seven because they need it. But, but do a little thought around where did that come from and maybe have that conversation and be like, why do you need this 24 seven? And then that being said, if there's business value to it, what, do you, what is it gonna cost? You could say like, hey, this is something we can do, but it comes at a cost to the organization. And we have to figure out how to do that. And one of the ways that you can, can kind of help is figure out how to get them involved, get that other team that's asking for this stuff involved in helping. Right, because it's collaborative. Because even if they're your customer, it's not necessarily just a dish off, right? It's not just, oh, well, this thing is broken, right? So it's, it's, it's it, again, it just comes back to conversation, which is tough. Um, and sometimes it does require those middle managers to get involved to help set those expectations. But I would, I, there, I would still go back to saying, how, how did that big disconnect happen, <coughs> right? Why, why does one team think it's a 24 seven service and the other one thinks it's not? Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, that's cool. it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Many. Thank you. Thank you.